Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman, and I'm here with my friend and trusted producer, Max Kerman, as well as our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. Today on the show, we have Mr. Matt Schultz of the band Cage the Elephant. Yeah, yeah. It's an exciting one. I was there for that one. I know. I feel like you were especially excited for this one. I was. We uh, we got home from Montreal that morning, and I uh, rolled off the bus and came right to the studio here, and we recorded the episode. It's cool. Yeah, he was a cool guy, man. Their album Social Cues is out April 19th, so uh, when you'll be hearing this, I think it'll be about a week from then. Is this guy a jokester at all? He looks like a guy who wouldn't be much for humor. Actually, this is a great um, point to make because when you look at him, you think he looks like a jokester to you. No, I think the opposite. He oh. looks like a more serious Caleb like Followell. An, ar- an artistic guy that maybe takes himself too seriously or something. Yeah, like and that. I saw him do an ad once, and he was just doing that thing. Like, you know how the artist tries to convey, I'm simply reading off the cue card? Like, they'll read it very poorly on purpose to maintain oh, sure. coolness. Yeah. I saw him doing that. Oh, okay, so that's what he so did. I was like, and he's probably not the funniest guy in the world. Well, he also... Um, is known for a lot of like iconic photos because he's very thin and wiry and their photographer just gets amazing shots of him bending over backwards. Like or, Iggy or, Pop style? Yeah, too? Iggy Pop right. style. Very similar kind of body uh, and physical performer. And uh, him climbing like the rafters on stage. So he's very theatrical and he has a um, very expressive face and he yeah. looks kind of serious, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And um, But I've never heard him actually talk in an interview, but he couldn't have been more sort of laid back and easy to be around and friendly to you know like he really tried to go out of his way to make kind of a, a connection and ask us questions and he had a very s- sort of southern sensibility about him absolutely he's from, but from did Tennessee. he make you laugh uh there's a couple like yeah kind of, it was it was loose like it wasn't like it wasn't intimidating in a way that you'd think somebody who sort of is a sensibly very artistic was he was loose like it oh, was cool. it was good yeah that's good to hear yeah so i, I really like that interview actually it made, it made me an even bigger fan of the band because i've always been a big fan of that band but yeah, that's a yeah good what's tease. cool has kind of changed. I feel like before, like when I was younger, being cool was like not maybe being the nicest person. No, it's being detached. It's being yeah. aloof. And yeah, now, Gen X style, you know? Yeah. And now I think like engagement, like genuinely caring, sort of being authentic is probably better than, you know, antiquated sort of ideas of like, you know, that kind of like, oh, he's a rock star. You know, he's temperamental or difficult. It's kind of like, I don't know if people really have time for that anymore. He's actually able to do both though, because on stage, his persona is sort of serious artist artist like throwback rock and roll performer but then when you meet him in person he's actually you know he's he's almost an intellectual i feel like yeah yeah so that's uh, a good tease for the interview yeah i gotta say so Mm -hmm. stick around for that like i said social cues is out april 19th uh check out our uh we have a tv show on crave yeah we're gonna remind you every damn week every time subscribe and excitingly like we said last week on the podcast you can go check out a full episode on YouTube right now. The Jodie Whittaker episode. Jodie Whittaker episode. Uh, Doctor Who is the show that she's the star of. Uh, I'm a huge sci-fi uh, fan, so it was a, a real thrill to talk to her. Uh, and that was actually one of the more sort of uh, enjoyable episodes for us, uh, basically off the top. We talked about a lot about your fear of flying, how you think you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, and that was you, a good one. you hear Barack Obama's voice in your... Yeah, he's uh, very soothing. Yeah. And uh, Shane, you also talked about your fear of flying. That'll yeah. be the tease. Go yeah. to YouTube and watch us uh, in, on our set, Mike on Much, and then subscribe to catch the uh, other six episodes with amazing interviews and uh, friendly conversation with mm-hmm. people like Alessia Cara, Lights, Sting, Shaggy. Leon Bridges. Leon Bridges, No Gallagher, Niall Rogers, uh, and the whole gang, as well as all of Shane's uh, hilarious digital desserts. And if you know how to operate Reddit, put this in Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will get a lot of upvotes. I tried doing it with the Jared Kiso episode, and I don't know how to operate Reddit as well, mm-hmm. and uh, it didn't get any upvotes. I feel, feel like the Reddit community knows a poser when they see one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you're just trying to get those Yeah, hits. when you're just trying to get popularity. They, they can see right through that. Well, I, I what I do is I create a new account every time I Well, that's try to the do first this. sign of a poser. But it'll be like, uh, you know, Jared Kiso fan or something. So I, I'm trying to make it understandable why I, a Jared Kiso fan would maybe just do one post and maybe sign up just for this. They can see right through that. But, but what are they trying to see through? I still have the quality content that I'm putting up. Like here's this sure. rare interview with Jared Kiso. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all of Jared Kiso interviews have over 100,000 views. Point is, maybe you're right, Max, because no one caught onto it. But then some other like hardcore Reddit dude actually made it like a good quotable from the episode and it blew up with like a thousand upvotes actually this is a great idea we this is a call to any mike on much listener if you're a real part of the uh, reddit community and you have a good user score or however that works dm us because we will pay you 
<laughs> how much? <laughs> to, to get our stuff in the mix. Yeah. I don't we know need how much. A, a Reddit make us an insight. offer. Maybe we'll, we'll make just, you an offer. Maybe we'll just have them on the show to talk to us about Reddit. Yeah. Maybe that's the offer. By the way, my favorite website is the Reddit NBA page. I, yeah. I'm a lurker. Yeah. I've never posted. I don't even have an account. Right. But or I do love Reddit. So. Maybe the offer is 50 bucks a post. 15 bucks or 50? Five zero. Five zero <laughs> bucks a post. Yeah, we all contribute uh, 15, no, uh, what, <laughs> what's the, about 18, 15, 17, 50. Yeah. Uh, okay, and and uh, I guess they have to prove to us that they're like part of the Reddit community. Yeah, we want to go through your profile, see what you're up to. Okay, well, if you're in the UK or in your, you're in the US and you cannot subscribe to Crave, then we have an episode, uh, two episodes up on YouTube. Mike on Much, go to our YouTube, check it out all over the world. This is your chance to check it, and hopefully, eventually, uh, it will be available to you in those territories. Yeah, I want to know what the Doctor Who heads have to think about I know. this interview. I, yeah. It's very similar to uh, Jared Kiso fans. They both Every interview with Jody Whitaker has over 100,000 views. So Man. I'm very hopeful. Listen, we hope you, you can be bought because we, <laughs> want, we want to uh, buy your influence on Reddit. Yeah, why yeah. not? Okay. Yeah. Good. There you go. Uh, Mike, how was uh, your weekend? How was the Nut's birthday? Yeah, the Nut. It's, it's actually uh, the, the Nut. Uh, it was his birthday. So he got a bunch of people together last minute to sort of do a birthday party. I mean, you were out of town. Yeah. Shane, you don't live in town. Um, Shane's I, looking furious right now. No, I'm glad to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, I, I was actually in Hamilton um, and I got a text at like, I don't know, three in the afternoon or something. It's just a nut in like a group chat just being like, uh, hey, it's like, uh, I think we're going to get together for my birthday for some drinks and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's Who's in the group chat? Just throw <laughs> some names. <laughs> I'm just curious. This particular one, I had my brother, Greg, Dan Hamilton, Max, uh, and Brent was right. in it. Yeah. Right. So what makes these group of people uh, in this chat? Like, Geography, uh, baby. Geography. Toronto. Yeah. What's the title of the group chat? Is that how it works? Best friends forever. Oh, nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it used to be called Don't Add Shane, but then yeah. they changed uh, the name to it. Uh, so yes, I got the, I got the, and then I was like, ah, oh, I was like, I'll come by for a pint because he was having people over to his place uh, to watch like college hoops or something. Mm -hmm. But this is the thing, guys, is I, it's such a negotiation now to find time to go out at night when you mm -hmm. have a young child you're in a marriage it's like you know it's all about compromise and, and, and the division of your time in a responsible way and you had a baby birthday party the next month <laughs> I did I oh did boy. actually our co-host uh, of the pedestal check that out too we don't promote that nearly enough uh -huh. uh, Jonathan Popolis it was his daughter uh, Joe it was her first birthday oh wow and so uh, we were going to attend that and it was like an, a 10 a.m. Tip, oh, tip off oh god <laughs> Jesus <laughs> so I was like you know, I, it's that thing where it's like, I'm going to do a temperature check with Danica. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll see if like, because the baby goes to sleep around 730. Uh -huh. People weren't even getting together <laughs> at nuts until like nine, like 845, nine or whatever for the start of the game. Because baby birthday parties, I just want to say, are <laughs> a nightmare. I hate them. Oh, and God. I was supposed to go to this party. Oh, we'll get to the party. Okay, I was just going to say, luckily, my daughter got six. So <laughs> couldn't, couldn't go. <laughs> okay, we'll get to the party yeah. in a second. But okay. before the party, I was like, I, I, I was like, okay, how am I going to take a temperature check with Danica to be like, hey, it's a nuts birthday. You mind if I pop over for a couple beers? They're watching basketball. And it's like, when's the right time to broach that? Is yeah. it while the baby's trying to go down? Is it during bath time? My wife gives me a bath every night. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we were bathing the baby. And I'm like, do I do it here? It's like, no, no, no. And then so the baby goes down. We're both sitting there. And she's kind of like looking at Twitter, Instagram or whatever. And I'm you know, kind of sitting there. And I'm like, hey. Uh, <laughs> Does she notice immediately when you when, you when your voice goes up through oh, your yeah. it's like, hey, uh, Danica. <laughs> it's like, what do you want? It's like, just out with it. Yeah. I'm like, it's the, the Nuts having like a little birthday gathering. I'm like, I might pop over there. He just lives a few blocks away. So it's a statement, not a question. No, I said, yeah, I guess. Well, no, because what? We're adults. I'm like, can I go over there? It's like, I'm thinking of doing this. Yeah. And if she's like, hey, like, actually, I was going to stay up and we're going to watch a movie. She was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to bed in 20 minutes anyway. You should definitely go. Yeah. I was like, sweet. Uh -huh. But we both know that we have this birthday party that we said we're going to leave for at 930 a.m. Uh -huh. I know I have to be up with the baby at like 7 anyway. So I'm like, I'm only going to go for a few and I'll be home by like midnight or something. Is, like there's that. no curfew. You say midnight. I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. I learned that lesson. Okay. <laughs> Low expectations, <laughs> yeah, exactly. baby. So, but when you just said uh, you'll be in home by brain. midnight, that's an internal monologue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so we watch the game, and then he's like, I want to go to locals. Everybody, we're rounding up. All of a sudden, three Ubers are in front of the place. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Sean Menard was there. What? <laughs> <laughs> Director How Carter does he effect. even find out about it? Uh, he was out for dinner with Dan and Greg. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But he has been in a previous group chat from that one Halloween time we went out with the Pizza Boys. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was a good time. Uh, anyway, hmm. long story long, uh, I wake up the next day and walk into uh, the Jump for Joy Play Center here in Toronto. Ugh. There's about 50 kids literally 
screaming, jumping in the balls, bouncy castles. What time did stuff. you end up getting home? Uh, I'd say around like you skip that part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trying to seem like a responsible adult here. Around ten to two, maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How hungover on a scale from one to ten are you? For me, maybe a four. Oh, okay. Yeah. But a normal human being, I feel ten like out of ten. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I actually even I went to the uh, the A and W on the way home, and I took a photo of this guy that looked like Jonas Valanciunas. Oh, yeah, you put that in the basketball Did you see that photo? Yeah, yeah. yeah. basketball. Oh, there's a basketball group oh, too. Man. <laughs> that you're not a part of either, Shane. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, anyway, so the party was. Uh, it was actually it was a good time. It was really nice to like see everybody and and and. Um, Virtuals or the baby one? Both parties. Wow. I enjoyed both, but I can see what you're saying about a kid's birthday party, Shane, because it's just like it's like everywhere from like six months to like four running around screaming. Screaming, <sighs> jumping, all that stuff. It was it ultimately ended up being fine for me, but yeah. Listeners, if you end up having uh, children or uh, you know getting married, whatever, this is what you're in for. But this is this is growing up, as uh, Blink One Eighty Two so eloquently said. That's right. Um, curious, is, do I have a terrible reputation within our friend groups for not visiting any babies? Because I've done no work. Is yeah, that it's talked out there. about? It's out there. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it. Did, I, you met my kid, right? Yeah, by accident. Yeah, because Danica was taking her for a walk, and you happened to be at the building. <laughs> yeah, I think I've met Lucy. I met Lucy. Well, a I brought times. her to the Crave Show. Oh, that's right. Of course, I have. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also, been on your TV show, yeah, Max. It's also hard to remember if you've met the kid or uh, you've just seen them on social media. Because in my mind, I've, mm-hmm. I've met all the babies many times. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here you know that's, what? That's the way I think about it. Literally. It's like high school reunions. I feel like you don't need to go to them anymore because half the f- battle is just seeing their faces, see how the people have changed. But you, yeah. now we know everything about each other, so uh-huh. there's no we don't need face to face contact. As it's much. a great social question, though, as far as like what is your responsibility in friendship to go meet the new baby? Because there's a lot of people like, oh, they, they haven't met the baby yet. We personally did not give a shit. You like, haven't yeah. seen the go. baby, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Where do you fall on that spectrum? I give no cares. In fact, I actually look at it as a little bit of a nuisance when someone drops by especially uh someone doesn't have a kid they don't know and they kind of tell you the time that they're going to show up like i remember sean dawson was like uh he's like hey i'm gonna come by and see that kid tomorrow i was like oh great and then uh he messaged me like the next day. He was like telling me like he's five minutes away or something like that. I was like, no, no, no. Here's how it works. I tell you when is okay in the day. I have the baby. The baby's doing crazy shit. It's having, <laughs> it's having nap time. It's like we got to tidy the house. It's a plan. You don't tell me when you're going to drop by. Mm-hmm. I like that you told me the day. I said, great. But now I'll tell you when's good. Mm-hmm. And then he just never showed up. He didn't like that. He, he never came. No. But I, I was celebrating. Like I don't, I, I don't care. But Mike showed up at the perfect time. I'm really comfortable with Mike too. So it's like that's another thing. Comfort level matters. Yeah. How close yeah. you are to the person. He brought a gift, and it was just the perfect time. So I really liked Mike's visit. But <laughs> everyone else sucked. <laughs> then, yeah, Mike did it. Mike did it right. Yeah. Oh, Danica gets all the credit. She she keeps things running on time. Man. Yeah. I just don't think I'm up for m- much uh, adult responsibility. Period. Like there's Same. things that are happening to me now that I'm at home. I just feel like I the only thing I do at home now are errands. I just am constantly doing grocery shopping, produce shopping, cleaning the kitchen, picking up this and random shit at the fucking mall. Like it is. I don't. I don't know if are you a neat freak or are these being. Are no, these, I don't care at okay. all. This is just about being a decent partner with Lauren because Lauren likes to you know ha- keep house and and I generally reap the benefits and I'm happy about it. But I don't know how anybody gets anything done because I feel like all I'm doing is is cleaning. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's it's work. It's it's it's, it's like crazy. basically constant upkeep with every. But that's life. I know, and but I it hate it. I know a lot of people do, but they don't really have a choice. I know. Or you like live in squalor, or you're unorganized, or things are all over the place. Uh, yeah. But that's what they say that you marry your deficits. It's true. Yeah. What's no. the most fun thing you do with your free time? Uh, I mean, I, uh, I mean, Lauren and I have lots of. I, actually, last night Lauren and I went to uh, Middle Ditch and Schwartz comedy show you guys have heard of this right yeah the guy no. from uh, 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 Silicon Valley yeah I'm, I'm shocked that you and don't ben know Schwartz. this so uh, Middle and Schwartz were just on Conan's podcast and that's why I heard of them oh. in the first place they're touring you know the guy from Silicon Valley right the main guy the main yeah, guy Thomas okay yeah, yeah and Schwartz turns out to be Jean Ralphio from Parks and Recreation if right. you're familiar with that show Anyway, it was amazing. They've sold out Carnegie Hall. They sold at the Chicago Theater. They sold out two nights at the Danforth. This is a plan. It's not improv. It's plan show. Completely improv. Whoa. It was amazing. And um, and then Ben Stiller was on Conan's podcast the other day. Heard and, that one. And he talked about Middle Eastern Schwartz. And he said Lin-Manuel Miranda, famously who uh, the creator of Hamilton, said it was a perfect show. 
because mm-hmm. they both saw the same show at Carnegie Hall. That's in New York. so much pressure if you sell out something huge. And what if you have an off night because it's improv? This is the crazy thing about improv is that these guys are so skilled at it um, that they can kind of get themselves out of any corner they paint in themselves because their mind is so expansive and their imagination is so uh, nimble that um, there were a few moments in the show where I was concerned. I was like, oh, this does not seem like it's going well. They didn't seem to break a sweat at all. They just kind of moved along and it was on to the next And that's half the thing. battle of what really makes the audience laugh is the danger is in the yep. air. And everyone that's knows exact- that, right? So basically, um, and they, they tell everybody in the crowd, do not film any of this. This is a moment in time. This is happening one night only here, and then it's gone. And um, they warm up the crowd a little bit, but just by making jokes. Middle Ditch is making jokes about being in Canada. Schwartz knows nothing about Canada. Everyone's laughing, having a great time. And then they ask somebody in the audience, what's something uh, that's on your mind? What's something stressing you out lately? And then some girl yells out, I I'm, I'm, uh, have a, the same recurring dream where my teeth get knocked out. And he gets all these details about her life like five or six details like she likes her boss she works in insurance she gets stressed out and her teeth are falling on her dreams and then from there they do about 45 straight minutes of improv and it was genius and the way they finished the show was also incredible like they wrap it up they hit every point that they need to and then they wrap it up like it with a perfect finale anyway like it's a callback right? yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and in every city, there'll be a different scenario. A different, and you know, it's funny. You could tell they didn't even like the girl who was yelling out stuff because the premise that she was offering like wasn't that imaginative. I yeah. think they were like hoping that it would be a little more interesting, but they kind of went with it. Anyway, I highly recommend uh, you, you check, out, check them out if you can. Solid review. Yeah, very, That's very a great good. Anyway, review. so Lauren and I did that. And uh, How much are tickets? Comped. I know. <laughs> how, how do you go about getting tickets comp? I uh, message our, our booking agent and he messaged the promoter. Oh, nice. Yeah. What does the message seem like? It's just like, hey, Max from Arkells, is that pretty much it? Yeah, it'd be like, for your consideration, if there's any extra spots. Uh, does that shit ever fly in the States? Yeah, occasionally. It does. <laughs> I'm always just curious. I'm not making fun. Yeah, yeah I know. But, but, but like anybody. And also, I would have paid for the tickets. I told, in this case, um, I, I told her agent, I really want to go. And if, if, I, if I can pay for them, I'm happy to. What's your uh, shooting percentage? In Toronto, like 100. Wow. <laughs> but also, I mean, keep in mind, like, we have a lot of friends in the industry. People are always doing favors for each other. That's sort of like how it works. It's so, true. Yeah. It's true. If someone says no to you, do you just go, never mind? Oh, Not yeah. that you would have had that I experience. never feel entitled to anything, really. Like, it's, it's such a perk of the job. All right, guys, do you think that we should get to uh, Matt Schultz from Caged Elephant? Yes, and um, another thing about this interview, it was very motivating for me because he talked about living in New York for the last six months and learning dance. Yeah. And if you guys recall, in last week's episode, I talked about wanting to learn how to dance, and that was partly inspired by Matt Schultz, just trying to develop a new skill set. And um, you'll hear that he's kind of interested in like an interpretive dance, I oh, guess, yeah. more modern dance. And... I am actually quite disappointed in myself because a week ago I said I was going to learn or start to learn how to dance and I haven't done anything. You haven't? No, I I started trying to play more piano like Randy Newman. Yes. That was my other thing that I was interested in. So that is uh, on its way. But the dance part... um, Would you ever get a choreographer or a teacher? I guess I could, but I'm starting with YouTube because everyone just... Whenever I say, should I get a teacher? They should go, just go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody always says to me. So This is when you were trying to become a doctor, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, the uh, you know I looked up after a conversation last week uh, Sam Rockwell dance moves yeah yeah and there's a super cut to like uh, uh, some oh. track and it's like yeah. all the late night ones the late night shows they've got those yeah. got every time he's dancing in a movie it's cut to like a James Brown song mm-hmm. I think but uh, I see what you're saying yeah and are you good at uh, are you guys good at taking on like new projects where you have to like learn a new skill when's like the last yeah. time you did that Max we had a baby. Oh, that's true. I guess that's a, a bit of not, a, a Chick new and I did project. not have a baby together, but we both <laughs> have babies. I guess there's no time for anything. But I mean, when was the no, last no, time? No, no, no. But what I was going to say Saying is... Saying that's a skill? That's uh, the challenge. Oh, sure. So it's like, I think when you decide to become a parent, it's like, well, who knows how life's going to change? And then on top of how... That's a selfish thought. How's uh-huh. my life going to change? Then you have to be like, oh, wait, how am I going to be like good for this... Essentially, okay, we, we, we made it clear that I don't care about babies, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I will say, <laughs> let's talk about like before the baby stuff. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Having a baby, too, by the way, is just a bunch of very mundane, annoying tasks, none of them are hard, so I'm very good at that stuff, but I am impervious <laughs> to learning. 
But you guys had to learn uh, editing software. Long it, took ago. Me, it took me way too long. I feel like I'm still not good enough to this day. I have a learning disability. <laughs> we um, we had a little technical glitch uh, in one yeah. of our earlier segments, and I know one of you is going to have to like look up online how to fix it and spend hours. Certainly, and yeah. Even you learning, I think you learning how to operate this thing was actually a bit of an accomplishment. Oh yeah, I mean, though, but I mean, this stuff does on a very like sort of more primitive level come easy to me. Like I understand, uh-huh. like, you know, when I was a kid, I learned how to like edit VCR to VCR, or just like mm. I was always the kid in my family that's like can you set the VCR to record something at this mm. time? Or like, I could just figure those things out. Oh, there's a timer on the TV. I've been able to work my way around those things in a way that's like serviceable and learning how to edit, use the machine. Those things come kind of easily to answer your question. The only things I'm interested in are things that kind of come easily to me. Well, me too. And so this is why I'm interested to see how I do with this dance project, because it's actually like a new skill set that I don't really have that any of my dance moves I have, I just have made up and have come completely naturally to me. But so, you have a good uh, natural rhythm. I, I think. do. But then, but what I realized is when I started to look at these YouTube videos, there's some hand eye coordination, some like things like the right hand's doing this, the left hand's doing this, the right leg's doing something different that but you're is, very athletic too. no but but footwork's yeah. big if you watch those sam rockwell things it's his footwork it's that his footwork. is really impressive like yeah. he's kind of doing those like james brown michael jackson like shuffle feet things and like like weird moves that's the stuff where you it's can like, do it you're a good basketball player you're yeah but again all, all that stuff always came naturally to me anytime i actually had to like learn um the mechanics of something even drumming's kind of hard for me and that mm-hmm. requires you know all of your limbs doing something different so I don't know. I, I appreciate your, your support, but we'll see. Yeah. I, I think what you're talking about is it's like the idea, like anything you do is something you don't have to think about. Yeah. The minute you have to think about it, it jams you like up. Like I'm not assembling any furniture from Ikea. Well, it's hard to be I cerebral never. about dancing because it's yeah. supposed to be this natural intuitive yeah. thing. And now you're thinking, oh, did I do that right or did I do that wrong? Yeah. Am I getting all the steps right? Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing is I've really, I think over the years, just started to outsource anything that becomes hard to me immediately. <laughs> So the second something gives me a tinge of anxiety, it's out the door. Yeah. I'm making a phone call. Somebody else is doing it. It's not worth it. That's all I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long is it until the, you're not even sitting at that microphone and there's just <laughs> yeah. some proxy? It's just manager Ash. <laughs> it's pretty close probably. <laughs> Honestly, like I haven't even like opened a bill lately. I just sent it right to the accountants and <laughs> I'm terrified of those Best things. Best thing about our pod is how relatable you are, Max, <laughs> to the common people, the fans that listen. That's right. People's trip. <laughs> Champ's here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, social cues. April 19th is out. Cage the Elephant. Uh, it was a great conversation. Me, Maxi, and Matt, at, and Rob Loud taking photos. We'll post a couple of those to promote. Your boy Rob Loud. Yeah, great tour photographer. That's right. Killers, Arkells. Mm-hmm. You guys want to get to Matt Schultz? Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to roll on this. We're just okay, going to, yeah. you know, classic podcast fashion. Love it. How you been, man? Doing well. Good, good. Excited about this new record? Very, yeah. Is that like the standard opening question that everyone asks you <laughs> a press junket? So are you dreading the album? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, very uh, very pleased and excited. We, um, uh, our friend Marika, who runs Plus One, I guess might be doing something with you. She said Brad was pretty involved. It's, it's you know, the dollar on top of every ticket. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and she says to say hello uh, to you guys because you oh, might cool. be doing something awesome. on your tour with uh beck yes we are yeah brad has been more involved in that that's what she I said know. he said she's like that guy is the keenest dude he's when it really, comes to yeah, uh, he's passionate yeah for sure one of the places uh we wanted to start just because i'm always fascinated sort of by the idea that like so like for me i come from a super blue collar family in like hamilton you know and then now i kind of work in this sort of media landscape and it's interesting but i had to sort of reshift the way i thought about you know something like money or having a career because i never even thought about that <clears throat> before I'm always interested like when you sort of have a, an upbringing that's not like super wealthy and then you jump into a situation where you're potentially making a lot of money and have this sort of like unique career do you have to reshape the way you think about it or do you sort of just approach things the same way you always did still trying to <laughs> reshape the way I think. are you good with money is the question <laughs> still trying to figure well, it out well does it look like it <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you, do you, I, yeah, you wear nice stuff but uh, do you have expensive taste I just funny I always think the way people react to money as because everybody has their own like sort of uh quirks when it comes to like oh i couldn't possibly spend money on this mm. or it's like oh i got the money now i'm gonna blow it like you know mm. uh i was yeah what, what what do you make of that how does uh, it work for you for myself i um 
I just try to like invest it back into whatever creative works that I possibly can. Um, yeah, however, however that however that manifests itself mm -hmm. through like music videos. Also, um, I recently moved up to New York in October and have like a little six month stint there where I've been studying different forms of contemporary dance and oh really yeah sick you're a great uh, physical performer so is that is Thanks. that with the intention of like putting it into the show in a way yeah just trying to uh, trying to be more present the more that I dig into it the more I realize that um, if you actually get out of your own way and uh, not interfere with what's happening um you're you're you'll find that you're pretty interesting on your own sure stole that from a robin williams documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, honestly was that the come inside my mind documentary? yeah that documentary yeah, yeah. was so good oh like, man i watched it on a flight and cried the whole time but honestly um yeah just trying to find more of that well that's interesting to me because i think for creatives it's like it's something that you start doing naturally i'm going to pick up a guitar i'm going to start singing whatever or if you're a comedian like robin williams you sort of entertain your friends and then you have to start to sort of start thinking about things like creative in a way that's almost mathematical or like how do i get out of my own way whereas before i maybe didn't even think about performance mm. in that way was yeah. that difficult for you as you sort of went along in, in your sort of creative evolution um, I, I don't think that you realize how difficult it is early on. Um, there's quite a bit of mellow, mellow drama happening and you're constantly trying to project and create this value that you're contributing to society at large or culture, pop culture, um, or even in like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And, um, I think that, uh... For myself, what I've been trying to to get more into is the creative process, and it's pretty intricate and detailed. As in, um, yeah, just the more that you can get get out of the way, mm -hmm. um, the narrative's pretty interesting. Well, what's a contemporary dance class look like? Like I've never, I, I have aspirations to be more of a, the Bruno <laughs> Mars school of dancing. That's cool. that is, and I've actually thought of like cool. I need to get good at that, but. A contemporary dance is a whole other world. What is it, what does a, a class look like for that? I have no idea. Um, so one of my instructors, um, his background started in hip hop, and then he moved into ballet, and then oh, wow. kind of a contemporary improv. And he's very very gifted. Uh, a, a lot of these different um, types of contemporary dance are similar, as in. Um, it's about intentionality. Mm. So you have an intention. There's something you're trying to convey. Like, uh, rather than just trying to be like, oh, look, I'm a good dancer or I'm creative or whatever. Um, one, of the, one of the types of dance that I'm studying is a Japanese uh, form, which is called buto, which is really interesting. And again, it's kind of all leading back to this thing of um, not to project. So with buto, it's very much a reactive art form you put your body in certain situations um sense memory things like this to trigger up real response but you're not trying to project a particular you're not trying emotion. to get to a predetermined yeah, space yeah exactly oh interesting you want to make decisions and not choices absolutely or choice choices is not, not. yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> does it send you home with homework like and then do you practice in front of the mirror kind of thing like or, uh, are you thinking about it yeah, yeah um there i mean there actually is one that's called the mirror <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the mirror, uh, whatever study, um, you, where you just observe yourself and how you observe yourself in the mirror. Um, but a lot of it is uh, extreme freedom within extreme restriction. So you might lock up a part of your body, and you're not allowed to move that part of your body it's to remain extremely tense. Oh, but wow. within yourself, you're free to explore whatever happens oh cool how does it how does the rest of the band as you sort of explore these other sort of avenues of creative expression are they like cool go for it man are they like sign me up <laughs> yeah my brother generally he's like does it look weird cool yeah do it <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna make for an amazing photo yeah, that'll be great <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um no they're they're very uh very supportive that's awesome that's cool i love that Man, now I want to do dancing lessons. Yeah, it's been um, that, and I guess a couple years ago, 
I, I started realizing that um, I, I couldn't probably master every single medium within the creative works, but if I could find that one common fiber, then I could maybe seamlessly travel through the different mediums. Sure. And and um, and make works or or whatever at a pretty um, potent level. Huh. I um, wanted to ask a question about uh, producers, because last time you worked with uh, Dan Auerbach and this time you worked with John Hill. What's the specific difference in, in their styles? Um, there's a lot of really big differences and a lot of uh, s similarities. Um, Dan is very instinctual and wants to capture that first... Um, the first... Uh, moment of something that real it's like th that's the purest that's the first exactly. time you do it is the real yeah time. exactly okay. so on that record a lot of the the takes were one takes oh really mm -hmm. huh. and then with with john he's um he likes to give things a lot of space um a lot of room to breathe he definitely has his initial instincts but he's very reserved mm. i mean both of them are reserved it's really interesting they just very similar in personality and very different in, in approach in the studio. Um, Dan would be, would be like, okay, it's done. John, similar personality, but you might ask him, like, so what do you think? And he's like, mmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you're sitting there, there like, you okay, well, I guess I'll go work on it more. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Communicate with me, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that he's, um, he's very patient and he waits to find the place where he can be most mm. impactful. Did you want to work with somebody new just to take people into kind of different headspace? Is that sort of, because I'm always interested when, because i um, listening to this podcast with uh, Rick Rubin and Malcolm Gladwell and they were talking about Tom Petty and Rubin thought that after like a record or two, Tom needed a change of producers just so he could try to impress the new producer because otherwise you kind of get too much in mm. a familiar rhythm that doesn't necessarily get the best out of you. Was it, what was the the thought for just for for switching lanes. I think for ourselves we're always looking for something new to get excited and obsessed mm -hmm. with again um, in our early records uh, Jay Joyce is a very great producer and he's very much uh, uh, has a um, has an approach and, a, and a, a certain sound that comes out of his production um, which is brought us some really nice hits early on in our career uh, with Dan, it was much more raw, and we learned kind of a classic sound and how to do that. And then with John Hill, it was uh, trying to combine all, all those different things as far as John's produced a lot of things from everything from like Santi Gold to uh, Shakira to Nas mm. to the last big record for Portugal the Man. And um, so we wanted to find a way to cohesively balance. Did you do any co-writing on, on the record? Um, or was it it, like w generally what a producer would sure, do. Sure, sure. We'd written most of the material when we went into the studio, uh -huh. though. Do you find within your, your band that, it, you know, choosing a producer or anything, making decisions, is a very democratic process? Or do you find that it's more sort of like... Do you just like throw your weight around? Leads yeah. Anyway. <laughs> You're this is the, the guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, here's the lyric sheets and... <laughs> the chords, here you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, no, it's very democratic. Uh -huh. um, we discuss it amongst ourselves, come up with a list of people that we, you know, our, our dream, dream list and um, narrow it down and... Um, just by asking who's interested. Yeah. Well, well, the the thing that I find interesting about the question about democracy in a band is because like I, I've worked with my brother a ton. I've been in a band with my brother, uh, and so like we were always able to sort of like disagree in a way that I couldn't with the other guys because you know that it's going to easily be gotten over in time. Do you have the same dynamic, or do you guys find that you sort of operate the same as you do with everybody else? Um, I think that with different personalities. Um, different perspectives you're it, you're going to disagree um, on certain things or just have a different view but I think over the years we've learned to be better communicators when you're younger you don't know how to you're like no. I feel all these things I'm angry yeah. I think I'm angry at you <laughs> <laughs> you don't like my heart how yeah. dare you <laughs> um, so how but, do you express that and then move I, on I think that you yeah. just get you you, you you learn to trust each other more. You know that you're going to get through it. Uh, patience is a virtue. And um, just communicate 
in a civil <laughs> civil manner. Well, for our band, I feel like we've the, the more we've worked together, the better we know each other's personalities. So you sense, okay. I'm not the person to be having this conversation with so and so. Maybe somebody <laughs> yeah. else is the person to be having. This conversation. Yeah, you know, it's like can we get our diplomatic, diplomatic, Ashley to have to talk to them yeah. about that. And I know it's not going. Well, you sound tell good. Brad he's being a dick. <laughs> well, okay, well, this is <laughs> what I want to get to though, because in the <laughs> Rolling Stone article, like uh, Consequence Sound, one of them, they said Brad was pissed with you that he you thought he thought you were leaving the studio too early, mm. and yeah, w um, is the brotherly dynamic a little bit more brotherly? <laughs> um, yeah. It has its moments. It's funny because a lot of those things, it's like you might um, you might riff out a whole paragraph of things that are like, and I really like the color of his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all these nice things. And then the oh, one the thing that, that, that sounds com confrontational of is course. the And it's the headline. Yeah. Those are the lines that make it into the <laughs> yeah, book. Of course. Yeah. It's like, do you, read, yeah, do you so read those pieces? Occasionally, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, I mean it's a Rolling Stone I mean, piece. well, you also want to learn what to say and what not to say. Interesting. Just, well, okay, well, actually, on that note, the... Um, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> the, the, you're probably pissed off about this other pull quote because, uh, but I found it interesting, and only because my band member mind goes here because they, after you finish a tune, you cancel the next two weeks of the session because mm. you're just in a tough space. Yeah, you're saying goodbye. You're, this is the way the story goes. In the yeah. Rolling Stones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the rest of the band like, dude, man, what the fuck are we gonna do for two weeks? You just let like, what, what, <laughs> like, like I was just thinking about what my band would do to me and uh, what their reaction would be. Mm. I feel like that I was in such a weird place that they had some people compassion for you. Yeah, for sure. I think everyone wanted to see me get better. Um, it was a rough past couple of years, um, you know, ha having a failed relationship, and um, my, my cousin, who was essentially my best friend growing up, passed away, and several really close friends passed away. It was just like one of those seasons in life where mm -hmm. you you get hit with a lot of unexpected. Um, uh, heavy moments that cause a lot of grieving, and so yeah, I think they they were really. Are the, are the things you're doing right now that you find to be particularly fulfilling, or just like able to have you sort of leveled out in a good way? Like, uh, well, like what's your like routine for? Because I always think being on tour, it's like, okay, what are the things that are going to keep me, you know, my mind at at bay? Is there anything that you like to practice in particular? Um. <clears throat> It's like 50 cigarettes and uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> um I, you know try to take care of myself uh with the dance the 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 dance and different um creative mediums that i've been studying has helped a lot sure that's probably therapeutic in a way you just mm -hmm. like be able to use your body in that way <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, let's get through this uh -huh. um, are you religious uh no, no oh, okay no, not religious uh -huh. um i don't i think it's more relational than sure uh, than ri ritualistic. N sure. not, no offense to anyone who no, no. No. is into ritual, but with um, you know, you mentioned having sort of like these tough times and it shaping the record and, and going forward. And it's interesting because it ends up becoming like a talking point for the press. So it's like I'm always interested when artists have to sort of relive these pains in order to express themselves through art. And mm. is it a conscious choice to sort of talk about it in the press? Is that something you're like, shit, I don't want to do it, but I sort of need to do it, and it's cathartic. Like, how did you view that for yourself? Um, it's undeniably part of the narrative of the, rec of the record. I know it's going to come up and it'd be weird to like tiptoe around like, well, that was a dark <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like eyes twitching. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, no, but it, it, whenever you take something that's. A, a real heavy adversity in life and you present it as theater or, or you put it in the space where um, uh, people might perceive it as theater. It's really interesting because first off, people are like, oh, wow, your damage is so beautiful. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. Thank you. Thank you. I made it myself. <laughs> Go on, yes. <laughs> um, I cut my own hair, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's also one of the um, one of the blessings of what we do is that we do get to uh, serve as a vehicle for a lot of people who otherwise might feel really trapped within themselves. I mean, I know how much I feel trapped within myself. Well, they don't have the tools to express it in some ways. So, like, if you're expressing it, and or they're the relating. space, Maybe exactly, just the space. Yeah, yeah. So then you find it sort of like um, it can be cathartic for them as well as for you, and then it does work. Ho hopefully, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, you have a, a real interest in like sort of movies, fashion, things like that. How do they shape sort of like um, 
I guess the creative you, you, you output, is there any specific examples of like, oh, that movie really sort of resonated and I mm. want to sort of try and express through music what the feeling or the vibe I'm picking up there? Is there anything specific? Yeah. Uh, I think that um, anytime you, you see something that makes you feel something um, uh, or excites you or speaks to you, it undoubtedly is going to find its way into at least your like, subconscious creative mind. Yeah. Um, I love Fast Bender's films. Uh, Ingmar uh, Bergman, um, Kubrick, David Lynch. What's your favorite Kubrick? Aronowski. Do you have Kubrick? a favorite Kubrick? Um, I loved uh, Lolita. Um, um, yeah. Obviously, Clockwork Orange. I was trying to think of films that <laughs> Barry Lyndon. Yeah, exactly. right, right. Yeah, no, um, yeah. Uh, and then with Fast Bender, uh, uh, The Bitter Tears of Petra Van Kunt, um, World on a Wire, Ingmar Bergman, Persona, Aronowski, Black Swan, sure. Pi. Um, I, I can't remember who, the name of the filmmaker, to my shame, but he just released the film The Favorite. Oh, oh, oh. Um, he, uh, I know. Uh, what? It's what's, he, what's, the, what's the previous movie? Uh, Is it Dogtooth? Is yeah. someone the favorite? Do you want to, who directed? Favorite? <laughs> Ash? Google. Can we get a fact Google. checker. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No. Um, yeah, but he's he's terrific. I saw a film by him recently called The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Oh, oh yeah, with Nicole wow. Kidman. Oh, oh my yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a family so drama. So good. It's yeah. crazy. But yeah, yeah. and then. I think to like, with fashion, yeah. not necessarily like the um, the activity of of, of like trying to pr present yourself in a good light or or an, an interesting light, but I like the art that informs fashion, w w where um, you'll see some really interesting things. But not, I'm not really into fashion for fashion's sake. What gotcha. do you mean? What is it? So the art that informs the. What does that mean? So like a lot of like. Uh, a lot of times you'll see photographers who are really influencing what's happening oh, or in, sure. uh, it's like a textural thing or a color thing or there yeah. might be an art movement or music that sure. is always music and fashion influence yeah. each other a lot. But like, um, I don't know, a s hat that looks like a stuffed teddy bear that's floating above someone's head. Maybe that's cool. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it doesn't speak to me sometimes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some really cool stuff. I think... Balenciaga is doing really cool stuff right yeah. now. Really interesting. A lot of stuff. times, I like their angle. Yeah, and then the and um, they're it's so bizarre. I follow them on Instagram. I'm like, mm. what the fuck is this? But then so, some of the stuff, like twelve months later, mm. will like, make its way into popular culture. Like that. That to me is the fascinating part about I fashion like, culture. Well, I really like their um, angle right now because it has a very Eastern European vibe mm -hmm. and um, I just like that idea for, for some reason right now. Sure. Um, so when we talk to um, comedians or actors, directors, all sorts of creatives, uh, they always have sort of like people they either like modeled after or they were like, Oh, I saw this movie when I was 13 and I wanted to make that kind of movie. Did you have, people like that as a front person where you go ah that's I like that I like that and maybe somebody that we wouldn't even think would jump out at us You're like oh, yeah constantly all the time really and I think it's it's a it's a culmination of many different characters and then not only maybe people who are popular that you might have seen through um, you know, through pop culture growing up but also you might see someone really interesting on the train and you see some little old lady who uh, just has a character about her and um, she hasn't been able to re-dye her hair <laughs> in like months and there's like you're like that looks really interesting I like that a lot <laughs> that's probably one of the charms of living in New York City if you're riding around on the train you're yeah, like yeah, totally. a lot of characters wow. just like a collector of um, of interesting personality characteristics who's your favorite front person that we wouldn't expect that would be your favorite front person Mm, I feel like all mine are super expected. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Mick Jagger, obviously. Oh, yeah. Nick Cave. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, ch -ch -ch. I'm trying to think right now. I'm drawing a blank. Tom Waits. Yeah. Um, Paul McCartney. Kanye West. Yeah. I feel like uh, Kanye. Kendrick Lamar. Is like, makes every rock dude's like top artist of their life list. He's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible it's, artist. Yeah.
And it's cool to see how he's built it as well. Uh huh. Uh, I love, especially when he's referencing his early career in, in interviews, and he's talking about how um, untrained he was, mm. and maybe how he uh, felt like there were things he was falling short in, and then how he continuously learned and sh- and um, strengthened his weak areas. I think that's pretty encouraging. Yeah, it's encouraging for someone that you're looking up to be like, oh, okay, cool. Well, there's hope for me. Yeah. He's like, he has this great instinct, but he's also able, he's a great talent finder too. Like he's mm. able to like, okay, I'm not that good at this particular thing. I'm going to bring that guy in who can really help strengthen this part of the production or the song or yeah. There's a, there's a visual artist out of Chicago. Um, he's long since deceased, but his name's Henry Darger. And he's become kind of like um, an outsider art legend. Mm. And he was a janitor. He was a janitor for, I I, I, I don't know if it was an elementary school or a high school, but didn't start creating visual works until well into his life. And it just became phenomenal. And he ended up making, he had a mental illness as well. Like, I believe he was schizophrenic. But um, he ended up making a a children's book that was like eleven. 11,000 or 15,000 pages and on so many illustrations sure. and it was incredible and he said that he thought that uh, God's greatest gift to man was that the, the fact that that humans have the ability to um, to have a skill but to improve upon it which is pretty amazing mm. um, I think sometimes we see the, situ- the situation that we're in or we're born into and we think that that's all that we'll ever grasp. And we accept those parameters yeah, without trying sure. to change the yeah. paradigm yeah. or evolve. That's fascinating. I mean, it's interesting. Well, so for pop, you've mentioned pop culture a couple of times and playing these things. And one of the things we wanted to ask is you guys have stayed sort of unapologetically like rock in sort of a climate where it's, I think it's hard to be a rock band on a, a popular or massive scale, but while also keeping an eye on sort of pop culture, I guess my question would be is that as you take a look around you at pop culture and sort of all these little things that you're pulling from, but then while still maintaining sort of what you guys do, has that been a conscious choice where you're like, we need to sort of maintain who we are instead of maybe chasing this or doing there or doing that? Um, I think that you just let your ears do the work for you. We're, we're constantly listening to music, um, stuff that was created in the past and then things that are very current and contemporary works and your ear is evolving it's evolving it's evolving mm-hmm. so you you um you're constantly challenging yourself what what you'll be interested in and what you're not interested in and those kinds of things and as that ear evolves you just incorporate what you love about those certain things into the process and mm. so just trying to get back to that place where it's exciting does it surprise me those kinds of things um yeah, I think with like it's like what is it that makes my ears tingle today? And maybe it didn't make my ears tingle two weeks ago. But totally. but you know, but you, it, I love your ears evolving because that I, I really believe that it's uh, yeah, just, and that's just the result of your various experiences and different things you take in. For sure, yeah. and um, I, I heard this guy, on, um, I guess on like uh, on YouTube that was kind of had this thing against bands that were considered rock bands that were like in his eyes disowning the genre and I, I always think that's really funny um who was an example of a band that was disowning the genre I, I don't know I mean just that people are like oh we're not a rock band or this or that um which I think is hilarious that no matter how hard as a creative you're trying to make something that's real and genres are the most um I feel like they can really be a hindrance on creativity the restrictive um, for yeah, sure exactly. yeah 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 and so it's funny that people continuously want to throw that over you as like this um cloak of restriction but uh, it's understandable because if you fall in love with a certain characteristic of of a person you want that to always be there um but um for ourselves we always we've always considered ourselves a musical group and not necessarily any genre based title just like a lot of the bands that we look up to, like the Beatles, I mean, mm. they they would reference themselves as a musical group, and um, and you allow yourself to kind of seamlessly blend through whatever it is that you're into, and you look at it more song per song, not a genre or a sound or whatever. Mm. I think that's where you get in trouble, honestly. If you do try to look at it oh, in sort yeah. of like a larger, we're a, a hip hop artist. We're a rock band. I mean, whenever that's when um, I think a genre becomes a cliche of itself. Yeah. I love the way 
Beck has managed his career, and like I feel like he's in the best spot in that the people that are interested in Beck like love that they don't know what he's going to do next. Like that is part of being that's part of a the Beck appeal. fan. Mm. We're like. <clears throat> surprise me delight me you know it's, yeah it, exactly and i was like oh that's the most like artistically like freeing place to be i'd imagine like i think kanye has a bit of that like mm. bowie had that oh it yeah was, it was just like after a while you're like i have no idea what this person's gonna do next <laughs> yeah, and i love right. that that's such yeah. like, a cool cool thing to to sure. aspire to. i think that i think that you know I, I, this is me speculating but i'd say this because they don't know what they're gonna do yeah next, you know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> like well this just came out <laughs> you know Wow, that was uh, that was weird. Yeah, <laughs> cool. I think. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I don't know if this is true, but we played Oceaga in Montreal. I think the same year as you guys did okay, a couple yeah. years ago. Did some of your band get stuck in Chicago? And did you? Yeah. Did did like the crew play or something, or did I make, or is that a rumor? No, that's the truth. Okay, what is the story? Can you explain? Because I've heard this. Is like this is stuff of legend. I know you were there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was like, I couldn't. I, I was watching from far back. It sounded great. But I, but then I heard after. I was like, you know, the full band wasn't there. I was like, do tell. Okay, <laughs> what what happened? Um, the flight got canceled, and yeah. so it was it was like. One of those situations where it truly was no one's fault. Sure. <laughs> you could <laughs> the play. rare situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I lost my passport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Dude, we told you you were going to Canada, man. <laughs> Bring your passport. Um, so yeah, the flight got canceled, and it was a really tight schedule as it was, and so. We commandeered someone's personal <laughs> uh, private jet. Oh, nice! And Classic. some of the members jumped on that and w were able to make it to the gig. Were you on that flight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But why weren't all the members together, like leaving the airport on the private jet? Like, uh, were we just coming from different spots? The, so the crew was on another bus, which they had made it up uh, to Canada. Uh -huh. um, we were f supposed to fly, and we didn't fly. Yeah. So that's what put us in the pinch. But did did the full band make the gig? No. But where were the band members that didn't make the gig? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And, and so who was missing from the band? Um, Jared was missing, I believe, and Brad was missing. Okay. And, and then, but the crew guys just like I. I and Kitchener, actually, I think three me band members missed. And so and who played for them? Like um, our uh, our drum tech and <laughs> our guitar player and our bass tech. And they're all they're all like extraordinary musicians who are sure, sure. able to step in and Yeah, and incredible artists in their own right creating their own music too. Yeah, that's actually funny whenever I hear our guitar tech like just like checking stuff and during before sound check I'm like, "Oh, this guy's like 10 times better than any of us." Right? <laughs> He's just like ripping <laughs> solos. What was that? Can you can you play that again? I'm get my voice my <laughs> voice no, no, no. more of that. Yeah, exactly. Good idea. <laughs> Well, Max, you've got to wrap it yeah, up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Thank you. This is fun. Thank this you. It's been great yeah, to yeah, meet you. Thanks so much yeah. for being yeah. here. With yeah, us. pleasure. All the best on the new record and the tour and everything. Yeah, I can't wait to hear the whole thing. Yeah. The first tune's awesome. Thank you so do, much. Do you do a thing with the, you like cut off a bar or something in the verse? It's like I've, it always plays with my ear in a cool way. Um, someone down, someone down, and pay. Like, I think you like yeah. do something tricky in a John Lennon musical y kind of way, which I'm like, ah, cool. Yeah, a, kind of, a lot of. Um, a lot of the instrumentation or, or the making of the record was kind of like playing editing as an mm. as an instrument, you know, which yeah. was a new approach. Really cool. Oh, so like uh, John would go, oh, what if we fucked with it? And well, I don't know. I don't know if that particular moment per se, uh -huh. but there definitely were moments on the record where it was like, let's see how interesting we can make this. You mess and with time yeah, in an totally. editing way. Or you, right. you pull something out. Well, sh maybe shift something just barely so yeah. that it's a little bit behind or uh -huh. kind of have that... Um, like warped tire feel to it yeah. or whatever. Well, the, the tour looks amazing. By the Spoons, were my my favorite band forever. And, oh yeah, and they're and that's between the third, you Beck and uh, Spoon. It's gonna be stoked. I'm stoked. So that's a stacked it's bill. Be a hell of a show. show. That's a good one, man. You guys nailed it. Welcome to the dessert. Uh, I'm going to tell you straight up, this is an unconventional uh, dessert. It's just Shane and I. There is no Max. We're actually recording this a little bit after, you know, even days uh, than what you've just listened to previously. Uh, if you, you know, remember from off the top, uh, we said that we'd had some technical difficulties uh, that, that Shane or I were going to have to figure out. And, uh, well, we didn't quite figure them out. It's just Shane and I sitting in a boardroom. I don't know. You want to tell them what happened, Shane? 
Well, we're putting the board in boardroom right now because <laughs> there is no dessert. <laughs> and I, I know I say that probably every other time, but this time it's not my fault. It's not your fault, actually. Is uh, it your fault, Mike? I don't even think it's my fault, to no, be completely honest. I, I think we'll blame this on, on technology. Bill Gates. Did he in, did he invent the Zoom? He uh, started all technology <laughs> when it's computers. Um, what happened was Shane had this great segment planned where we did the newlywed game starring uh, listeners of the pod. Cody Parn and Bethan. Yeah. How come Cody gets a last name, but Bethan doesn't? I just go by Instagram names. That's okay. it. Yeah. Um, so uh, they were fantastic. Uh, we recorded like an 18-minute segment. Uh, the, the reason was because they met... Uh, because of our podcast they they matched on tinder uh, because they both understood a mic on much reference which was really nice and, and uh, in one of bethan's photos she was wearing a mic on much uh sweatshirt i believe yes and then that's what was the impetus for them to even talk about mic on much then they connected on that and we found out like even though they're only in like a month relationship they're in love <laughs> that's a fact i feel bad because uh it was such an awesome they were so funny and uh charming and the it's so i guess just to walk you through it quickly since there is no dessert today and they're just still listening mm -hmm. uh we recorded the whole segment um but because we were missing a microphone we had to use a, an attachment on this device that we use so originally i thought these people were from toronto and they were going to come in and record it live right before we comedically right before we recorded this episode i found out they were actually living in ottawa so we had to come up with a last minute solution to record uh this over the phone the phone audio yeah and, so it was and, like and just as luck would have it we lost one of our xlr cables so typically we would just <laughs> hold a microphone up to the phone but we also needed you to have a microphone He's pointing at me, Mike. Uh, you, Mike Veerman, <laughs> the host of Mike How Much, needed a microphone, of course. So Mike had this uh, little contraption that we rarely use that uh, kind of pops onto the top of the H6, which is the device we use. Yeah. And it totally fucked everything up. Uh, we recorded the whole 18 minutes. Um, we hit stop, which is fine. Then we took the attachment out, and the H6 froze at that point. Now, if anybody here works with, like, uh, files or technology at all, you know when you see that little frozen, like, uh, the wheel, as they call it. Wheel of death. The wheel of death, that it's bad news. So we stopped. We were like, oh, shit, that's not good. I went and checked the card. There were still four audio files, and there was, like, 79 megabytes of info. So we're like, the files are here, even though they will not play uh, on QuickTime. Shane's like, I've encountered this before with the H6. I think I can save the files. So I did a little Bill Gatesing of my own, <laughs> and I get on the computer. I'm looking up tutorials. I finally figure out how to get it working, with the exception of Mike's file. Mike, all of Mike's audio was coming through, like, well, today's dessert. So it was, like, slow motion. So I was talking to Mike. We came up with the solution. We were simply going to speed up the audio and match it with the other audio that was working, where you could kind of hear Mike's faint audio in the background. But then when I went to do that, I realized that, holy shit, all of the files that I did fix were only three minutes long. Three minutes. Right, and we listened to the three minutes, and it cuts off right as we're introducing Cody Parn and Bethan. Yeah. The true tragedy of this is Mike had some killer lines in this like some great <laughs> laughing points i was like i was almost jealous okay i was jealous because we, that we had this part i'll just explain it now um where we asked them like we really were getting into how often they made whoopee we were calling it because on those newlywed shows they always ask like what's your partner's favorite position to make whoopee and it's like it means it's code for sex as i'm sure you you know but at the end we asked them to end it we were like have you ever um made love to or made whoopee to Mike on much episodes and they were like oh no but we might start and we asked them if they've ever made love we're in the merch it was a, a whole ridiculous segment and then at the end uh, we asked them if they've ever made whoopee listening to an Arkell song and then they said uh, they said no but if we if we did I wonder what song it would be and then Mike went boss is coming <laughs> and then we all laughed because uh Coming has a double entendre there, of course. <laughs> I'm sure the people appreciate you explaining. Yeah, it <laughs> and then I remember uh, I was like on the bus ride home. I was like, "What should I have said that there? What would have been funnier? How could I have outdone Mike?" I was like, "Knocking up, up the whore." I was like, "I was like, nope. Glad I didn't say that. That would have gone bad." <laughs> So uh, we apologize that uh, you don't have a dessert this week. I uh, blame the technological gods. But because I thought that uh, Bethan and Cody Parn, 
Cody yes. Farn, uh, were so great uh, on the segment. We're going to have them back. So they were in Ottawa, and the next time they're in Toronto, we're going to bring them into the studio, and we're going to do the, the, the either the newly dating game or the... Uh, they could actually be wet at that point. Or so. maybe not even together. Yeah, a breakup newlywed S game would be interesting. It's all on the table. So that will be at a future episode. I guess that's that? Yeah. Sorry, guys. Blame the H6. That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Michael Much Podcast is produced by me. <laughs> the People's Champ. The People's Champ. Thank you to everybody who listens. Thank you to everyone who makes this podcast possible. Uh, like Max said, he produces the podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman, here at the Pop Culture Fish, not Shane Cunningham. See you next week if we don't die on the Boom. <laughs> Mike on Much can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Mike on Much. You can subscribe to the show on any platform that has podcasts, uh, Spotify. Do it.